I'm delighted to have this opportunity and I think the next two days are going to be really an exciting um, <clears throat> conference for all of us, so um, thank you to the organizers. Uh, today I want to talk about coastal ecology and eutrophication and pose some challenges for modelers and uh, managers as well. What the overriding message that I want to convey to you today is that we have not only changing nutrient loads, but we're changing those loads in terms of forms and ratios. This has effects on phytoplankton communities, not just a total amount of algae, but their composition. This has effects on food webs, and this poses a lot of challenges for our modeling and management communities. I'm going to take a very wide-ranging review here. I'm going to talk first uh, about some global scale changes, then drill down into cell physiology and talk about uh, the specific effects uh, uh, at the species uh, cell physiologi physiological level and take that up through food web effects and come back to some global modeling. So lots of scales. Um, we'll, we'll talk about <clears throat> many different organisms, systems, processes along the way. There's no question that we have a huge nutrient footprint, particularly a huge nitrogen footprint. And this nitrogen footprint comes from uh, our increasing world, excuse me, um, our increasing world population, our increasing nitrogen consumption through energy, we are growing more food, uh, meat production, we're using more nitrogen fertilizer in agriculture, aquaculture is expanding at a very rapid rate, <clears throat> and of course this nitrogen uh, accumulation is also in concert with phosphorus accumulation, but as I will show you, the trends in changes in nitrogen differ significantly from the trends in phosphorus. Our nitrogen loads have been increasing uh, and continue to escalate uh, in just the most recent decades. We're not only changing the total amount of nitrogen that we're using in terms of fertilizer applications, we're changing the composition of that uh, fertilizer as well. So now uh, more than 50% of global nitrogen fertilizer is used in the form of urea. Uh, we've moved away globally from, <clears throat> from the application of ammonium nitrate and uh, it has to do with the fact that urea is much more stable uh, when transported uh, and applied. Ammonium nitrate happens to be a little bit explosive. Um, so we have a urea use increasing around the world. This has consequences for the chemical composition of the nitrogen that runs off into our streams, rivers, and coastal waters. As urea breaks down, it uh, breaks down into ammonia, ammonium, and so it's not unusual now for us to see increases in concentrations of ammonium in coastal waters. Uh, this is at Maryland Coastal Bays. We now have ammonium concentrations that average 10 and 12 micromolar on an annual basis, much higher than just um, a decade or so ago. We see the same thing in San Francisco Bay Delta. In this case, the ammonium is coming in from ammonium um, sewage uh, plants that discharge ammonium, but we now have considerable ammonium um, in the water column. I spoke about urea a moment ago. Uh, this slide, that this analysis we published um, quite some time ago, but it shows the global change in urea from 1965, when urea was not used around the world, to <clears throat> um, around the year 2000. And you can see even in countries like Canada, Australia, 
South Africa, where we don't normally think of eutrophication problems as being uh, very large. These are countries that are using massive quantities of urea, and of course through China and India um, especially. <clears throat> Aquaculture is growing and it is another source of nutrient pollution. Uh, it has expanded uh, massively since uh, just around the last two decades. Aquaculture can be a polluting, nitrogen polluting industry. It's a confined animal operation with feed that's added and a lot of that feed, uh, whether it's as fish or um, <clears throat> manufactured feed is not consumed by the fish and contributes to uh, regeneration and recycling of nutrients as well as all the excretion that comes from um, fish and shellfish operations. And many of these aquaculture operations around the world are expanding in an unsustainable way. So. Um, there are many places where these are becoming very eutrophic because of expanding aquaculture. Now, we know that uh, not all nutrient changes are created equal. We are not changing our use of nitrogen at the same rate that we are changing our use of phosphorus. So I showed you this slide earlier. This is the trend in use of nitrogen fertilizers. The trend in phosphorus fertilizers, um, it actually decreased in the mid-1980s for a number of reasons, one of which was the removal of phosphorus from detergents. Since then, the use of phosphorus has increased, but the slope of this increase is not nearly the slope of that for nitrogen. In the US, Europe, and Australia, the drop in phosphorus came about the same time because uh, the removal of phosphorus from laundry detergents was, it occurred around the world at the same time because Procter and Gamble did it. And as a consequence, uh, globally, we have nitrogen fertilizer increasing, phosphorus is increasing, but not nearly at the same rate. The end result is that the N to P ratio of our use of nitrogen relative to phosphorus is increased about threefold. We see this in all parts of the world, except um, India and China, where the use of phosphorus hasn't gone down nearly as much um, as in many other parts of the world. So the end result is that we are driving nitrogen to phosphorus ratios higher and higher. We see this in many parts of the world, many coastal systems. This is the Potomac River uh, tributary of Chesapeake Bay. The N to P of loads increased a lot um, up until about the year 2000. We've been a little bit more aggressive at taking nitrogen out since then, so they're starting to come down. We see this in San Francisco Bay Delta. N2P has been increasing. Uh, sorry about the change of units there. And the Rhine River. So example after example, we see this trend. Um, in many cases, driving the loads far higher than what we normally think of as a stoichiometrically balanced nitrogen to phosphorus load. So <clears throat> we have more people, more food, more fertilizer, more vehicles, uh, even more water diversions, which also has effects on nutrient supply. I'm not going to get into that, but the end result is that we have more eutrophication around the world. So we are awash in nutrients in many coastal systems. We tend to think that we understand what the process of eutrophication actually is. Uh, in general, we think that the process of eutrophication involves an increase in nitrogen to phosphorus loading. This results in an increase in chlorophyll in the water column. 
that can result in shading of seagrasses, so loss of seagrasses, and it can result in hypoxia when all of this material begins to uh, settle and decay. One of the consequences of eutrophication that we don't understand nearly as well is the change in biodiversity. Biodiversity at the phytoplankton level, biodiversity at all trophic levels. So I'll come back and say um, quite a bit about why we think we see a shift towards increasing harmful algal blooms. <clears throat> we know that the consequence of eutrophication is hypoxic zones around the world. We'll be hearing more about that. We know another consequence is harmful algal blooms, which are increasing in frequency and occurrence and duration and geographic extent around the world. We see a global trend in harmful algae, whereas in the 1970s, not so many documented cases. Many places in the world now have many more occurrences of harmful algal blooms. And this is not just due to increased monitoring recognition. This is, in fact, um, a real documented increase. So what's the evidence of a direct relationship between global changes in nitrogen increases and the increased proliferation of HABs? Well, a number of years ago, we took um, a model from Global News, the, one of the very early ones. You'll be hearing more about Global News over the coming days. This shows nitrogen export. And we just compared the occurrences of this harmful algal bloom species per centra minimum, and it seemed to line up with those um, places where there was a lot of nitrogen export. We took that one step further <clears throat> using one of John Harrison's maps um, where we looked at the percent of organic nitrogen coming from anthropogenic sources, and again, compared that to per centra minimum. And indeed, at least on a very broad scale, there is some correspondence. And if we look at the correspondence of the blooms that produce paralytic shellfish toxin and where they occur uh, relative to that global map in urea, we can see again um, expansion in many of the areas where uh, we have been using much more uh, nitrogen fertilizer. We see this in China. China is a place where fertilizer use has increased and the number of red tides has increased accordingly. In the East China Sea, <clears throat> here's the aerial extent as well as the annual number of HABs. You can see it's increasing. If we look at that trend relative to urea use in the watershed, there is a direct relationship between the aerial extent and annual number of HABs with uh, nitrogen use in the watershed. The most extreme example of this comes from Lake Tai in China. Taihu is an area, <coughs> a freshwater lake. Um, it's a water supply for uh, many millions of people. And it's now choked with microcystis. Microcystis in Lake Tai used to occur about one month a year. Now it occurs about 10, 11 months a year. If we look at the uh, nitrogen loading in the watershed um, over this time period, we can see it tracks the same uh, pattern. And <clears throat> if we correlate urea use in the watershed for these uh, decades of data with the annual duration of blooms, there's nearly a perfect correlation. And that correlation increases if we look at the urea to phosphate loading in the watershed. So a 0.9 correlation for um, environmental data is pretty good. So now let's ask the question, does phytoplankton composition change in response to nitrogen form, even when the concentrations are not at levels that would otherwise be considered limiting. So does it matter whether we put in ammonium or urea or nitrate? <clears throat> we 
We know that <clears throat> phytoplankton respond not only to the total amount of nutrients, but also their form, and we know we have lots of forms of nitrogen in the watershed. We know that algae can take up a range of nutrient forms. If this is a cell, they can take up ammonium, nitrate, urea, um, many other forms of nitrogen. I want to simplify this discussion here to ammonium versus nitrate as the end members of the oxidized forms of nitrogen relative to the chemically reduced. Nitrate and ammonium are metabolized differently from each other and are used differently by different phytoplankton groups. So the bottom line message is it matters whether we provide one form or the other. Classically, we consider ammonium to be the preferred nitrogen form. It's taken up more easily across cell membranes. And so classically, ammonium is used first and only nitrate gets used after ammonium is drawn down to some level. But we know that these are metabolized differently. We have, when all, both of these forms of nitrogen are taken up via transporters at the cell surface, getting into some cell physiology here. As we add more ammonium to the water, the number of transporters for ammonium actually goes down. The cell downregulates its ability to take up ammonium. In contrast, when we add nitrate, the cell upregulates its ability to take up nitrate. Difference number one. Difference number two. Ammonium uptake increases with temperature. Nitrate uptake decreases with temperature. So we have second difference in metabolism. And we can look at all of these differences. Uh, there's also a time of day difference. <clears throat> the end result is that cells metabolize nitrate very differently from the, the, than they do ammonium. Now, diatoms are somewhat unique, and diatoms often form our spring blooms. They like nitrate, and they like nitrate under cold temperatures. They can store lots of nitrate in the cell. They actually need nitrate for their chemical energy balance, and ammonium in the water column interferes with their ability to take up nitrate and to metabolize nitrate. So diatoms often are compromised when we have more ammonium in the, in the water um, in spring blooms. And it's one of the reasons why we may not uh, be able to maintain diatom blooms <clears throat> under high ammonium loading in the spring. In contrast, dinoflagellates and our little pico cyanobacteria uh, have a larger capacity to take up and assimilate ammonium. Dinoflagellates, as I'll say more in a moment, um, can also assimilate particles and they are digesting those particles, so they have more ammonium metabolism. The end result is that as we shift our nitrogen inputs to more ammonium, we have a community that's dominated by cyanobacteria, chlorophytes, dinoflagellates, and cryptophytes. Whereas if we have more nitrate in the water, we have more diatoms, as a general rule. We also have larger cells, and we can make more total chlorophyll. And we see this um, if we do experiments in mesocosms. We see if we add ammonium, um, uh, we get cyanobacteria. If we add nitrate, we get diatoms. And this is very consistent with the oceanographic principles that we are aware of, of new and regenerated production. New production, meaning more nitrate, we make larger cells, we have more grazing by larger zooplankton. We also get more export from the photic zone, whereas ammonium um, drives the microbial loop. So there are consequences to changing nitrogen form. <clears throat> So the next question is, does phytoplankton community composition change in response to changing nutrient ratios, even when those loads are not at levels that would normally be considered limiting for phytoplankton? The dogma is, and we'll challenge this as we go along, 
There should be no selective effect that might distinguish between the potential performance of any pair of planktonic algae so long as the resource concentrations are able to saturate the growth demand. <laughs> so in other words, the dogma is if the nutrients are at saturation, they're not regulating. Um, but we know that there's a great diversity of phytoplankton in size, in growth rate, in composition. Uh, I love this figure published by Zoe Finkel a couple of years ago showing the diversity of phytoplankton sizes in relation to common things that you might know about. <laughs> um, this change in cell size and composition also relates to their chemical composition. So for example, diatoms have a carbon to phosphorus ratio of about 50, whereas Seneca coccus it's about 100. That has consequences. So as we drive systems to higher nitrogen to phosphorus ratios, what are the consequences for phytoplankton community? And there are several. Um, there are various metabolic strategies for coping with this high nitrogen to phosphorus condition. <coughs> the first strategy is that cells can access an alternate substrate. So for example, if inorganic phosphorus is low relative to stoichiometric demands, they may be able to access organic phosphorus. Another strategy is mixotrophic nutrition, being able to eat. Another strategy is that cells can dissipate the excess nutrient. This is part of the overall strategy that physiologi physiologists call overflow metabolism. One of the consequences of overflow metabolism is that some algae can make carbon-rich, nitrogen-rich toxins. So toxins have lots of uh, functions in cells, but one of the reasons that they may be produced is this overflow metabolism. We know that many mixotrophs are winners as N2P increases, and we also know that many mixotrophs grow faster under mixotrophic nutrition than they do under inorganic nutrition. So they become mixotrophic under high end of P, they're also growing faster. Mixotrophy and toxicity may be synergistic. <clears throat> the release of toxins harms the prey, releasing dissolved nutrients or making the prey easier to capture. So you have a mixotroph putting out toxins, um, and then being able to capture the prey. We know that many toxins are produced uh, at a higher level under high end P ratios. So this is um, the paralytic shellfish toxin, saxitoxin, typically produced under much higher end P um, than under stoichiometric balanced conditions. The same is true for Primnesium parvum. <coughs> makes a number of um, bio bioactive compounds, um, but um, it makes its toxin to a greater extent when it's not growing under stoichiometrically balanced conditions. <clears throat> and the same is true for microcystis. Microcystin is made under higher NDP conditions, and all of this makes sense. A lot of these compounds are nitrogen-rich compounds. Uh, we can see that this is the case in Lake Tai, where in 2007 the water supply was turned off, leaving two million people without water for a week due to um, toxins due to <coughs> microcystis. And you all know this story very well. <clears throat> so let's now take this up the food web. Uh, do changes in nutrient quality and quality affect the food web? We've talked about the changes in quality of nutrient and the changes in quality and quantity of primary producers. What about food web shifts? <clears throat> well, our classic idea is that it doesn't matter as long as they get enough carbon. <clears throat> but we all know that eating just calories isn't the only thing that has to do with your metabolism. If you eat a 2,000 calorie a day 
donut diet versus a, <laughs> a balanced diet, your metabolism is affected, and the same is true for food webs. So um, our current perspective is that the total nutrient load sets the total amount of productivity that can be uh, a system can maintain, but it's the relative proportions of nutrients that sets the quality, who's there and how they are doing. <clears throat> And this is formalized in the concept of ecological stoichiometry. Nutrients affect food quality, in turn affecting food webs. The ecological stoichiometric perspective says that an animal's elemental composition is linked to its evolved structure and life history. That is, different animals have different needs for different elements depending on their structural makeup. So it takes a different proportion of nutrients to make skeleton and bones than it does to make muscle. So if you are a grazer, it matters whether you're grazing here or here. It matters because it's toxic or not, but it also matters because you're getting a different amount of nitrogen and phosphorus. And this has effects on biomass composition, it has effects on nutrient regeneration, it has effects on the ability to reproduce, it has effects on egg composition, it has effects on egg viability. If we are, <clears throat> um, if, you, if, if an animal has flexible stoic, uh, uh, stoichiometry or little or no homeostatic regulation of stoichiometry, if you have a diatom community, for example, with an NDP, it's grazing, it makes its NDP, it's releasing NDP, and it sort of keeps that in balance. But a lot of grazers do not graze at the same NDP that their biomass requires. So if you are a diatom community, for example, that's been enriched with nitrogen because of some external nitrogen load, but the animal is strictly homeostatic, that is, it maintains its biomass N to P strictly, then it's going to put out more N relative to P because it has to maintain its biomass composition. And you keep doing this several cycles, and the grazers feeding on P-limited algae tend to accentuate P-limitation because of proportionately higher end excretion. So it's self-perpetuating. So anthropogenic change can push systems into a new nutrient cycling dynamic through changes in nutrient and phytoplankton stoichiometry. So it matters, again, whether grazers graze here or here in terms of N to P. And let's just take a moment and look at the effect on egg production and egg stoichiometry. Here are a couple of experiments that we've conducted using two different um, copepods, Akarsha and Yuri Temra, varying the end of P of the phytoplankton, keeping the end of P, keeping the carbon the same, and here's the percent viability of the eggs. Uh, drops considerably as we drive into higher and higher end of P. We see this in the long term. Um, this is California. <clears throat> Yuri Temra drops out as we drive into P higher. It's replaced by another copepod. Um, that's true in the spring and the summer. And we can see the ratio of these two, two copepods varying over time. This is 20 years of data. And it varies exactly inversely in proportion to the N to P of the water column. And that is a pretty strong relationship. So we're driving community compositional shifts due to changes in nitrogen and phosphorus loads through the different physiology of these copepods. We see the same thing higher up in the food web. This is long fin to silver sides ratio. Um, this is California again. Um, the shift occurs in relation to shifting NTP ratios. 
We also see this in relation to the number of invasive species. So here's the number of invasive species in the Rhine River increasing with this <coughs> increase in nitrogen to phosphorus ratio. As we change the environment, we change the habitat suitability for species. All right, so um, now I'd like to just say a few minutes, a few words on what's the projected impact of nutrient changes on the likelihood for HABs in light of the fact that there are other stressors like climate change. So to do this, um, we've worked with um, a number of modelers, um, some in this room, uh, looking at linking nutrient loads with other global changes um, and our understanding of phytoplankton processes to project future states. So first getting the loads right to do this. Uh, we've, the, these models have applied global news models. You'll be hearing a lot about global news, I'm sure, from John and Arthur, but these uh, models <coughs> take nutrient sources from as many as 5,000 watersheds worldwide, um, take into account hydro hydrology and physical factors in, in water processing. And these models for the purpose of understanding um, changes in HABs are appropriate because they can provide us information on both nitrogen and phosphorus and by form. And I told you earlier this application of how we use these models earlier to look at per centrum distributions. So what about other changes? Uh, for this application, we used the IPCC 100-year uh, projection using the midline projection of climate change. So what did, what did we do? Uh, working together with the uh, modelers from Plymouth Marine Laboratory, um, they've got an uh, oceanographic model, a uh, physical model, <coughs> together with an ecosystem model um, that can project a uh, different community composition. The model is carbon-based, it's a functional group response, and it includes a complex suite of nutrients as well as processes linking um, both the um, upper water column and the benthos. <coughs> so what did we do? We took two time slices, two hab types, and we explored the output in terms of habitat suitability for HABs. And uh, in terms of habitat suitability, we use some of these notions of changes in nutrient ratios and form, understanding the um, effects on diatoms and the likelihood for HAB dinoflagellates as we increase ammonium and nitrogen to phosphorus ratios. We looked at um, two regions, Northern Europe, East Bal Baltic Sea, and East Asia. And the two HAB types were per centrum and Karenia. I'm only gonna talk about the per centrum results here. Um, we defined habitat in terms of a number of simple rules. We said these, these cells live by a couple of simple rules, one of which is they have a temperature, range, they have a salinity range, and they live <clears throat> outside typically the bounds of what I call the Redfield comfort zone, and they live typically in a more uh, nitrogen reduced relative to an oxidized environment. <clears throat> and these are what these blooms do in the East China Sea. Uh, in terms of the model, <clears throat> Climate change effects in the model alter both growth rate and the dynamics of nutrient biogeochemistry. So it's, um, I'm not going to get into the details of that here. But uh, we projected habitat suitability for these blooms. So here's the present day for uh, per centrum in the Baltic, e East European coast. And we've got these hot spots. 
and the scale indicates the percent of pixels in the model with suitable habitat conditions based on those rules we defined. Here's some real data, um, and we can see we're picking up the right hotspots. So um, in general, the model picked up the right places. This is not projecting the intensity of the bloom, rather it's more like a risk map showing habitat suitability. Um, here's the East China situation, um, here's the present day model, here's a red tide index that was published. So again, we're picking up the right place. Here's our projection for 100 years out for habitat suitability for Pura Centrum in the um, northern European coast. We see this huge potential in habitat suitability for HABs. For the East Asia situation, we don't have as big a range um, increase, but we also see this northern expansion. And this is all area where um, aquaculture is either present or being considered. So um, it's a smaller relative expansion, but it increase in geographic range. So what are the bottom line implications for modelers and managers? Let's come back and debunk some dogma and uh, throw out some, some ideas here. So first we have, our first uh, misconception is that nutrient changes due to anthropogenic input are occurring uniformly with respect to different nutrients. So we can refer to nutrient loading or nutrient enriched conditions. I prefer to say that nutrients are changing in proportion and forms with consequences for total productivity and community composition. So we must consider changes in nutrient loads, but also forms and proportions. I told you I'd come back to this statement that there should be no selective effect um, on phytoplankton species uh, for a given resource if the nutrients are at saturation. Well, I hope I've showed you that ratios can and do matter even when nutrients are not in limiting proportion. So we need to consider effects at saturation and begin to explore implications of overflow metabolism, not just effects of limitation. We've often thought that it takes both nutrients to um, promote growth, but it only takes limiting one to limit growth. Um, but I hope that what I've shown you is that control of a single nutrient due to management actions can drive a system into stoichiometric imbalance with consequences for species compositional shifts, including HABs. We've often thought that nutrients control the base of the food web, but not the structure of the food web, and that the strength of bottom-up effects diminishes up the food chain. Well, nutrient stoichiometry um, can affect food webs through nutrient recycling and effects on biomass stoichiometry, egg production, and egg viability, increasing the possibility for invasive species, pushing systems into um, a new nutrient cycling dynamic. So nutrient forms and ratios do matter not just for total biomass, but also for chemical composition, algal composition, composition of the food web, including the propensity for HABs, and including the propensity for invasive species. So models have to begin to take these into effect, and there's a lot of progress being made. Lots of new types of models, are taking nutrient ratios and forms into effect. We see it um, in lots of different types of model structure. Multi-stoichiometric models are advancing, and um, I think this is uh, all uh, very positive. So balancing our needs for nutrients, 
for food production with the negative consequences of nutrient over enrichment, it's going to continue to be a challenge. And these challenges are going to be great. Anthropogenic changes are driving systems into stoichiometric imbalance. This can amplify positive feedbacks that can result in HABs, invasive species, changes in food webs. We have to begin to expand our horizon beyond thinking about just TN and TP. And we have to begin to think about not just the global scale, the um, management implications of this. We need, as algal physiologists, to understand much more about organismal and ecosystem responses to nutrient saturated and supersaturated conditions and stoichiometrically imbalanced nutrient loads. So our escalating NNP footprints will likely continue to result in more blooms, more toxins, more human health impacts, more ecosystem impacts, more economic impacts, more places if we continue on this trajectory. So finally, and I know I'm just about out of time, uh, nutrient loads are changing throughout the world in form and composition. Phytoplankton have different nutrient preferences and requirements. Different forms and stoichiometry affect algal community composition. This ultimately has effects through the entire food web. Similar trajectories of change are occurring throughout the world and these changes are projected to be large. More chemically reduced nitrogen as ammonium, urea, and higher N to P are leading us to more HABs. So we have to continue our efforts to reduce nitrogen as well as phosphorus loads. And with that, I want to thank lots of people who've contributed to a lot of the work that I've shown you today. And thanks for your attention. Great. Well, thanks so much, Patricia. Uh, we do have another coffee break now, but we have time for a question or two as we're starting to get your coffee. Uh, I'm just curious what, what your reaction would be to the argument that we occasionally hear that that um, part of the problem is because of the fo focus in Ontario, at any rate, on limiting phosphorus, and that this argues in favor of actually taking our foot off the phosphorus break in order to drive ratios back to where they used to be, especially when we see increasing oligotrophic conditions in places like, like Ontario. Um, you know, we need to know what to say to that argument, basically. Well, I've heard this argument from time to time. That is, um, well, we can rebalance everything by just putting phosphorus back in the system. Well, we have so much nitrogen there that we're just going to flip everything into a hypoxic condition. So that's not going to solve our problems. Good answer. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> So, okay, so the invasives, I kind of went over that quickly, but um, a species doesn't take hold in a new environment unless the habitat is suitable. And so just propagule pressure alone, that is, whether it's ballast water introductions or um, transfer of species by whatever means that we are introducing species, those species are not going to take hold unless that habitat is suitable for their growth. Um, I can transport palm trees from Florida to Alaska day after day, and they will never take hold unless um, climate change or the chemical environment of the receiving environment has changed. There are a whole cascade of effects that are nutrient effects, biogeochemical effects, um, trophodynamic effects, all of which are changing habitat suitability. So as we, and changing nutrient ratios is one. Um, and we know that we change 
the type, so in terms of fish, we know we change the type of fish that uh, occur in a high nitrogen to phosphorus environment relative to a low nitrogen to phosphorus environment. It has to do with body structure, it has to do with feeding capability, the, the, um, whether we shift from planktivores to piscivores, et cetera. There's a, that's, that, that's fairly well established. So, yeah. so well, total N matters, but total, an increase in total N, if you're not changing P, is driving the change in ratio. Right, so what about the, like, the ammonia to total N? Oh, um, <laughs> that's going to have an effect on food webs. Um, as we move ammonium to higher levels, in some cases, we're actually seeing toxic levels of ammonium, levels that are causing inhibition um, at food, lab, food web effects. So that's a whole different subject that we can have conversations about later. I'd like to uh, break for coffee now. Okay. So we can continue this conversation over coffee. Sure. Thanks for